Hello everyone, welcome back to the Daniel Z Show, episode 8. Today we are here with the founder of News Lounge, Sanjay Balkode. Hi everybody. Alright Sanjay, before we uh, get to News Lounge, it uh, looks like a puzzling new startup. Uh, let's talk about your high school experience because I always like to ask this question how does someone get to <laughs> making a startup which is the craziest thing in the world right. I mean they must have been doing some crazy stuff when they were in high school so what were you doing then? Well the crazy thing I was doing was trying to play music more often than doing any in my academic studies in high school right and so I wasn't as well focused on academics as I should have been right from grade 9 to grade 13 we had 13 back then and so really I wasn't I, I didn't skip classes I just didn't do well because I was more interested in being actually a musician so I think that was the start of my creative sort of a creative foundations that helped me to start Muse Lounge from so way back then and, and at that time you were just wanted to really just play around with music you had, that was your passion correct it's always been your passion I just wanted to be a rock and roll star were you in any bands or I was in bands in high school I was in a number of bands and really? played on the stage people were yelling my name out it was pretty fun <laughs> that's awesome yeah and then they were making me all nervous <laughs> And uh, after after uh, after high school, Ed, you got you got into uh, college university. I did. So what happens is after high school, I was sick and tired of the academic side of things. So I, I said to my parents, I'm going to take some time off. So I worked in restaurants worked and learned what hard work was about. Like bartending. Uh, no, no, just waiting. just serving, serving and and food prep and dishwashing, which is the most exciting part of that. So dishwashing, I've heard, is the most intense thing. <laughs> it's very intense because there's a there's a billion dishes. If you think you have a lot of dishes at home, you have no idea how many a restaurant oh, has, right? Restaurants. And no automatic, right? It was just strictly by hand. You were strictly by hand at that time? By hand. There's no, no automatic dishwashers then. So we, so I did that for a while. And then some point in time, my parents said, Sanjay, we need to talk. And they said, oh, it was one of those uh, one situations, of those right? And they said, you need to do something. You need to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Decide which one you would like now. <laughs> and okay. so, so I said, okay, engineering. And so what I did was I wanted to fast track it. I went to Algonquin College. For in a very rapid two, two and a half year program, including the co-op periods, you got to basically learn uh, like digital electronics engineering technician stuff in a hurry. And you got to spend two co-op periods with companies. And so I was picked up immediately, which is really awesome, by a great company out in Elmont. And I did that, did it so successfully that they called me to for employment right after uh, wow. I graduated. There was no looking for a job. They just said, you, Belco, job. So and uh, this was uh, at, at what time? This, <laughs> do I have to tell my age here? <laughs> no. So that was oh, nineteen oh. yeah nineteen eighty eighty four is when I when I graduated from Algonquin College. Okay, and you and then you got into uh, this company. I got into a high tech company. That was the start of my high tech career. So at that time, high tech uh, must have been different than. High tech was different. Back then it was really all system level design. No one was designing integrated circuits and semiconductor industry barely started out, even though semiconductor did exist and was actually uh, laid the foundation for a lot of semiconductor design companies in Canada with a very system, uh, early company called Microsystems International, for which my mother worked at too a oh, long wow. time ago. Before, you know, when I was a very young person, she was working there for 80 cents an hour. Oh my God, uh, what was she doing? What she was doing was wire bonding. So you know inside an integrated circuit, there's <laughs> a little, little, little silicon die, and then on the ends, ends of, the, of, the, of the packaging at that time, there's wires, and you would have to, to make those connections from the outside terminals oh through the inside to the in outside, and that's what she did. And that's what you, and uh, did you join this uh, company later? Uh, no, I, I joined a different company that was dealing with an automated fax technology company, which is, in, in fact, it was, called, it was like Telefax, right? That company wasn't bound to be lasting very long because essentially they were dealing with the technology that was going to be usurped by other technologies and the internet. Why send something via a telefax machine, which is the old type where there was you would actually could type in things oh. and we made an automated version of that, which is insane. Um, and so it wasn't going to last long and eventually it blew up at some point in time and I found another job after that. But that was nonetheless a great start because it, gave, it laid the foundations of all of my system level knowledge, which I continue to use today. When did you really start getting into business? Like you, you, you're, get, you're curating all this knowledge. Right. So were you waiting to curate enough of it in order to start something that's worthwhile? That's a, that's a wonderful question because what happened to me was I spent many, many years of my life in, pure te in a pure technical stream, right? I was effectively uh, a technician class individual working with engineers who were wonderfully uh, very nurturing, 
very mentoring uh, uh, of my, in my career, and it was wonderful. But at some point in time, what happened was that I realized that I'd hit a ceiling in a salary. At that level, I wasn't going to do any better. And so one day at a company, at a semiconductor company, years later that I worked at, for, uh, called Mosse Technologies, I spent 10 years there. The sixth year there, what happened to me was, uh, there was a little sign that went up and said, internal posting, sales, professional sales position. And I said, I could do that. Professional sales position, you're like... Right. Correct, I was going to sell uh, uh, basically uh, either, either full custom memory design services, which is very sophisticated, and I had learned it all then from my technical streams. And then what I, what I also learned was a lot about all, all the legal mechanics of, of that position as well, because I had to do a lot of contractual work then too. And so basically, I said, I can do this. And it was a very hectic job, et cetera. And the VP of sales at the time took one look at me and says, this guy runs around a lot and goes crazy, is very intense and wants to get things done. I think he's the right guy to do this. And that started my, my business slash sales, you know, slash a little bit of marketing, small end marketing career. Did is that what really like hit you as a passion? You're like, Yo, I really like this. This is really fun. Well, the one, okay, so if, if you don't mind me being a little <clears throat> capitalistic in my, in my leanings I here, mean, go for it. the money was going to be really good, right? And it was, I was going to double, triple my salary. With, with, with basically the commissions from the from intense sales. sales that we had to do, right? And once I figured that I would have a sales career underneath me, if I can sell the most complex design services in the world, I can sell anything. anything. Absolutely. Right, exactly. So this is what laid the foundation for what I call a more disparate sort of experience and in, in being able to experience a, a significant variety of, of business environments, right? From not only semiconductor companies, but system level, software companies, et cetera. And, and without that diversity, I think I would be um, having less, you know, let's call it just skills and experiences. Well, so you, you, you went through all this uh, experience, all this knowledge, you got the sales business experience, you had the technical side. How did it all come together to form Muse Lounge? A fantastic question. So I had already been a musician because as you know, I wanted to be a rock Absolutely. and roll star. Uh, I, by today, I've been playing musical instruments for 45 years. Long time. I'm not a young startup entrepreneur. I like, man, like there are many wonderful ones in the city of Ottawa and Toronto, etc. So what happened was is that I was able to combine my business knowledge, my understandings of, of the whole what's, what's in the corporate environment, what happens inside a corporate environment. And when you're running a, a sales practice, you're running a practice within a practice. Effectively, you're responsible for your own revenue within your practice, if you, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is also gives you the strong rules and responsibilities, the, that role and responsibility of having to bring in money. At one point in time, it, I, I was going to be required to bring in over $90,000 in, in, in salaries in just two weeks. But that wasn't enough because that wasn't running the company as well. So that was in a design services company where our payroll was $90,000 American Canadian and I had to bring in that kind of money. Wow. So it's intense, right? That's not an insignificant amount of money. That's every two weeks, by the way. 90, Jesus. Well, 90,000 dollars. That's, that's, that's right. So it's an interesting, you know, I didn't even think about it, then I just did it. You right? just did it, yeah. So that's awesome. I want you to think of the combinatorial experience of digital systems design with software design, because I did that as well. You I, did that? I, I, I programmed in 18 different software languages, oh my God, yeah. sales and all that. And then a lot of exposure to some wonderful business people that really rounded out my full knowledge to be, to have the confidence to say, I can do this. And so once semiconductor melted and my career wasn't going where I wanted to, unless I was going to move to Boston, Austin, or say San Jose, California, I decided I was going to stay in Ottawa from, from a family reason perspective is I decided, well, I think what I should do is start a, a company. So I, for four years, I just sat there when I was doing other jobs, working head well. Head down working. Just heads down working, just thinking in the back oh, of my right. mind, what do I want to do? So, and I decided I should do something music because if you consider the largest base of my aggregate knowledge, it's music. Yeah, absolutely. It's music. It's the number one thing I know. I know more about music than anything else that I know combined. Well, you're going all in on your passion with this, right? Correct. 
So for the audience that doesn't know, what is the primary function of Maze Launch? What are you trying to accomplish? Okay, so here it is. So ever since the advent of very complex electronic devices and instruments. So remember, so for example, a device is, is, is a, you might be aware of what a compressor is inside the audio space or the music technology space, right? Or say a graphic equalizer or things like that. Well, those are electronic devices. Well, then what would be an electronic instrument? A keyboard. Right, as an example, forget that. Well, in 1983, a great thing happened to the music industry, and that was the advent of MIDI, the, the, the birth of the musical instrument digital interface standard. This is a world-class standard. It's no different than the standards of, of the internet and Wi-Fi protocols that you use on a daily basis, like 802.11 something, or 802.3. something, right? So picture that this standard, what it did was allow all those complex devices and instruments to be able to talk to each other and computers at the same time. So now what, we, what, what are the benefits of, uh, benefits of that? Well, instead of having 36 keyboards on stage or some preposterous number, even 10 is preposterous because we only have two arms or the yeah. keyboard is only has, I want you to imagine with one keyboard, a very skilled keyboard, say like Pat, Patrick Moraz or say today uh, Jordan Rodessa Dream Theater, they use just one keyboard. And then they could play a whole series of keyboards series and have, of have thousands of sounds at the tip of their fingers by the use of the MIDI standard with that. So, but here's the problem. The underlying problem is, is that all these devices and instruments have very complex hardware front interface panels. Absolutely, yeah. Um, is this the same uh, thing that I see a DJ would be using? No, not necessarily. No, DJs essentially they have audio equipment, but, but picture the complexity of that distilled even worse and, and made more difficult. Oh, wow. So if DJ panels, front panels, have lots of knobs and all that, yep. well, they live in a physical realm of, of their performance art that they do. They need instantaneous action. Well, it doesn't work that way in, music, in the music industry. The way it works with all these complex devices and instruments, you set your sounds in your rehearsal space, your studio, or whatever, you do it there. But on, when you're performing on stage, you just use your sounds. Okay, but what about the interaction of that front panel? Well, I want you to imagine that, let's take an example. I love this example, and, and I hope it's, it's instructive and helpful. Absolutely. So picture that you have a stereo amplifier at home, just a generic one, not a surround sound receiver. Regular stereo. It has only three controls to modify sound, volume, bass and treble, that's it, yep. right? So, and those modify sounds. Now let's add a, mid, a magical functional, piece of functionality to it to save the settings of those three controls. We set volume to three, bass to two, and treble to five. And then we save it, we call, we call Daniel's setting number one. And then you save it to, you set to different settings, and then you save that to Daniel's settings number two. Mm -hmm. I want you to picture that even a basic digital effects processor that can make your guitar sound like anything from Eric Clapton to Jimi Hendrix or anyone else for that matter, there's 110 controls inside there. Wow. And then what they have is a tiny display, which is this big, and one line of text, and then they have three controls, and every time you want to change one control, you'd have to move one of two or three controls at one time. You'd have to rotate or, or push knobs or buttons and all That's that. That's insane. The amount of work effort involved in doing that is significant. So this has been a problem that amateurs, the professionals alike, and everybody in between has suffered with for that long since the birth of 19, since of the MIDI standard. Since the MIDI standard. So is this something that uh, Muse Lounge is supposed to change? Yes. What, what is is that the main different factor? So here's what we're doing. I want you to picture we're going to abstract a very complex hardware front panel into a very simple software front panel. So it's going to be, it's going to, it'll have an elastic interface that runs on, say, your smartphone, which is rather a small real estate, so I wouldn't necessarily use that, but say a tablet or a laptop or a desktop. So picture those 110 controls now abstracted on this nice screen that you have in your nice laptop. And then you can just scroll through pages of 110 controls, or 200, or 300, or 600 controls, like on the synthesizer. And then you'll be able to make rapid changes with either a touchscreen interface or a mouse, for example. So I'm just have my computer, I can go around and Correct. make quick changes? Correct. So I want you to imagine that what our company is offering is not 2x performance or efficiency differences. That's too small. It's 10. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it'll actually help you by, by, by increasing your efficiency and productivity on these devices at least tenfold. We think, we think it might be higher. Now, add to that the notion that, well, if you have 
this abstracted software control, very elastic, et cetera, fast, et cetera, et cetera. I want you to imagine now, well, what you're doing is, your premise is to make sounds. So right. you're gonna control that effects processor so that you can sound like Eric Clapton to Jimi Hendrix or anybody in between. Now, you're making sounds, and then what happens is when you're gonna perform, you're gonna save those sounds, and then you'll just call, recall that sound on stage. And that's what musicians do every day of their lives. Absolutely. Now, but I want you to imagine that, well, what if there's, say, 10,000, 20,000 of those effects processors sold? What if there's 100,000? Well, there's a whole bunch of other, other musicians on the planet, men and women alike, using these things. Well, we're gonna create an online community for you to save those sounds onto the community as well. So not only is it saved on your laptop, the sounds are also saved share on the community. community. And share, exactly. You can share, sell, or buy sounds if you want to. And then you could discuss with other musicians too these sounds. You could search for them. You'll be able to share on multiple devices. Like let's say you have 10 different devices from 10 different manufacturers and 10 different model numbers. So there's going to be a pay service. There's going to be a, what? What's okay. how's the rollout? Okay, so the rollout is a great question again. It's so we've got a we've got a working alpha prototype. So we say what we do. The alpha prototype does what we say. We're now embarking on an, uh, the beta. The beta consists of three things: is an encapsulated application that runs on iOS, and then we're going to have the online social community component of it. And then we've already launched our corporate website. If you went to museelaunch.com, for example. Yes. So we're just building all three of these things at one time. Essentially, we're, we're programming the, the app and the, and the community, and we're just adding content, more substantive content for the musicians to the, get them to better understand our offering. So it's all beta rollout, but here's the coolest thing. Beta is free. Yeah. Beta is going to be free. And here's the other cool thing. We're going to crowdsource some help from musicians. So musicians. The primary thing about musicians that's the most beautiful thing about music is they share. So if they play a song for you, what they're doing is they're sharing their work with you. It's no different than an oil painter that when you go to a vernissage and you see their wonderful work, you're, you're hearing it in the, in, as opposed to, say, being able to visualize it like a piece of art. They not only share their, their music, but they also share their everything else. So let's say you have a high-end professional musician like, say, Steve Vai or John Petrucci. Did you know that we know exactly every make and model of every piece of equipment that he owns, including the cables, the wiring diagrams, everything, because they tell you that. And, and now mind you, they have guitar techs to manage their complex systems, right? Is that picture that musicians share. So what we're gonna do is, is crowdsource some of, the, some of the work efforts that we need in the company. And if you help us out in very simple ways, we'll give you that when we actually launch the real product, like 1.0, you're gonna get a year's worth or, or something, a variant of, a year's worth of our software application for free. So membership in the community will always be free like it is in Facebook. But the application, there's two levels of it. The first one's free. And, the and, there'll be a pro and then there'll be a pro version, version of exactly. That pro version, it, we're gonna offer it in a SaaS model, 9.99 US a month. Great. And no restrictions on that sort of thing, right? And all that. So that's, that's our rollout. That's something that uh, I'm passionate about, EDM music. And it seems like this is something that's going to be, it, it, it will really help them in, in terms of rolling music out right. quicker, because it, it is since it is one of the fastest growing music industries in the world right now, people want to roll out faster. They want to roll out more efficiently. Mm -hmm. How do you how are you gonna, uh, trying to target that app, that audience and how are you bringing them on board? I love the question because it demonstrates your understanding of what it is I talked about. I want you to imagine that even the earliest forms of EDM, I want you to think about when it sort of more or less started. So you're talking about like Sweet Dreams, Eurythmics? That's, yeah, things like that. Like because that. that was a synth age of 80s, really. Yeah. The, the birth of the synthesizer age was the birth of the EDM, right? So I want you to imagine Duran Duran. And by the way, they're still hot. They're, they're touring and they're still amazing, right? They did a concert recently in London, England, right? I wish I was there, right? Because I love all forms of music. There's very little music I, I don't prefer. So I want you to imagine that very complex synthesizers were used back then. Yeah. And they've only got more complicated. So what's happening today is there's a, there's all the synthesizers that are being pumped out today are being used for EDM. There's a new class of equipment out there called modular synths as well. Now you've probably seen, if you've ever looked at um, some of the famous synthesis out there like Skrillex, 
Yep, and there's a, there's a dead yeah. mal, right? If you look at what's behind him, he's got all these modular sins. Like his, his studio or space is mind bending, right? Yeah. You know, people think that what I have is mind bending, but no, no, he wins. He wins. He who wins with the most toys and dies with the most well, toys wins. He lives some of his. Uh... Right. Sometimes, yeah. Now those modular synths haven't adopted MIDI yet, but I suspect that they eventually will. Now they're resisting change is what they're doing right now. Modular synths are simply a new version of something that happened when, when Robert Moog was creating Moog synthesizers way back when, back in the 70s. Wow. So, so we've actually, so if you, think, if you think fashion goes back, we'll have bell bottoms and weird looking stuff that we wore in the 70s and 80s, it's coming back. It's coming back. So music does the same thing and retro music is hot. So for example, retro synthesizers from the 70s and 80s are worth lots of money on Reverb.com or eBay or Kijiji. People are asking for like a synthesizer that was bought for 300 is being sold between 2000 and $4,000. That's, if that isn't a validation of retro music, I don't know what is. And then if you listen to the In the Key of C uh, with uh, CBC, uh, on, I think it's on Saturdays at 5 uh, p.m. Little shout out to him. Craig, Craig Norris, I think, is the, is, the, is the host there. Here's the deal. Here's what happens. Is listen to the number of bands putting out music that has shades of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So we, in the music, are doing like what fa the fashion industry has constantly done, is we've gone back to some of our roots and we're bringing those back. So to round about your answer, that's so why I went about it in a roundabout way, is that EDM has a, is, is a potentially the largest user base, synthesizer users of our, of our company's products and services. How are you looking to market to them? What, are, what kind of tools will you be using? Right. Are you going to be using Facebook? Are you going to use, I don't know, newspaper ads? What, what's your main marketing method, marketing tool that you're really using to reach out? And have you already started? A fabulous question because, because this, is a, this is a question that's being asked of every startup now. Absolutely. And I think it's a question based on, you, it's all great to have a product or service, but if you can't get it out there. So, what's the point? Uh, so yeah, what's the point? You're not going to make it without social media because no. frankly, print media is, is dying art. Yeah, you've heard about recent Canadian news of many newspapers being shut down and magazines and print publications yes. being decimated. So the key, the, the way forward is social media platforms. Absolutely. You know? And by the way, you need to pay for, for actually getting better exposure on Facebook because their algorithms don't let you disperse your content to the extent that some people think they do when they don't pay. Yeah, even on uh, the Facebook groups and I, um, a lot of the marketing I personally did was to Facebook groups. And uh, they worked well until about the about last month, where they started uh, basically banning people from using per, for a right. week on their and posting on Facebook groups because Facebook groups were such a good way to market. Right. And uh, I thought that was really interesting because now they really want people to use their ad product, even even if they already are. So. Uh, how are you using the Facebook ad product for your for business? So right now we are because beta is not out yet. Once beta is out, there's a rule in the music industry is if you've got something, show me, but it better be working. Okay. So we're not ready to, to show that yet, but here's the deal. We'll use every social media platform uh, within our means and ways, number one. Number two, we will pay for the use of some of those social media platforms because as you've so wisely indicated, so uh, Facebook is throttling the bandwidth. It's the second largest advertising platform on the planet, second only to Google, by the way, the, the stats actually weigh this out, right? Yep. Is Google AdWords still exceeds Facebook's ad revenues and usage uh, statistics by a significant amount. And only 10% of, let's say I, I, I have 800 friends, uh, only 80 or less will see my posts. So you try, I'll certainly use it in an organic sense, but then having the paid portion of it w w works. So use every social media platform. Now, now we have a three-pronged strategy. So apart from using social media platforms, you use those in sort of an XYZ perspective with the three fundamental overlaid with the three other perspectives that we're gonna, we're gonna do. There's three ways to look at how we're gonna disseminate ourselves to the world. Number one, top down, professional musicians. So the one thing I've had influencers. The, influencers. The ple I've had the pleasure, privilege, and honor of talking to professional musicians, great. and they actually confirmed that I, I I say what I know and I know what I say, which is a great thing. So is to get them on board and then have them be influencers. So when you look at, for example, let's say I get to Eric Johnson at one point in time, he's only got seven hundred thousand followers on Facebook. 
Now I exaggerate. That's a great number. That is a Sometimes number. Much, that's a huge number. <laughs> so all he has to do is get it out to 700,000. That I'm using this new thing from Muse Lounge. I've got 700,000 people that have become aware of this, right? Now then what he'll do is he'll tell two friends and so on and so on. And then, so we've already sort of started to incubate a bit of that network to get those out. So that's the top-down approach from a distilled perspective. The bottom approach is to take my family and friends and to threaten them to say, please let everyone that you know uh, about, about my thing or I'll come over to your house and I'll do something, right? Okay. <laughs> and then the middle way is a, a neat thing too, is that it kind of combines the two of the above. The, the horizontal way is, is to actually go to manufacturers and say, hi, we're gonna control your machine with our software for free. And, um, you know, so we've already tested that with uh, two companies, two genuine music industry manufacturers. Awesome. I'm not allowed to say their names right now. They're mid-tiers, they're, mid they're, they're not small, they're not huge, but they're mid-tier. And they go, we're in. Just get it ready and we're in. We'll help you all you want. We'll help you with the engineering aspects. We'll do, we'll do the testing. And then what we'll, they do is, they typically have a significant user base in the amateur sense, right? So they have lots of amateur and semi-pro users. They'll let them know. But the key is to get their, what sometimes they're called resident artists, the ones that are very beholden to them because they use their stuff and they, they love their stuff. Well, they get, they, they'll say, well, why don't, we got our, our machine that you use. Mr. and Mrs. Professional Musician, uh, well, here's some software to go with it, and suddenly yeah, your usability went, went way high. So the testing with two companies, testing of the idea. So we've signed an LOI with one, we're looking to sign an, L an LOI with a second. So there's a lot of proof of concepts there from the, the family and friends are helping me out, the manufacturers said yes. Why wouldn't they say, say yes? And professional musicians, let's just say that, here's some of the lines that they said, They've said to me, well, well you know, um, so Lance Kellner, who's a pro musician out of Austin, Texas, who knows 10 professional musicians and is ready to talk about, he said, Sanjay, where have you been all my life? Wow. Like, so he knows, what, he knows about this problem intimately. So I've talked to Polo Jones, here, we, here comes the name. He's the bass player of an internationally renowned band called Zuccaro. And he says, I'm ready to help you whenever I want. We'll connect you up with my studios. Uh, and uh, it's called Tool Sedge Studios, by the way. A little shout out to Polo Jones, an amazing guy. He spent an hour with me and I get to hang on his tour bus. Is that, let me know when you're ready. I'll make it happen for you, Sam. Well, giving them the ultimate value, right? Correct. You are literally changing the course of their business. Correct. And uh, I think in a bit time like this, making content out, whether it's in the music form or whichever form it is, doing it as often as possible is the key. Right. And to add to, add to what I've said here is what's, um, what I've, so what I love is comments by my peers and non-peers alike. And you always want, to add as, as a startup, one really important thing is to always get your, always be having checks and balances. So talking to as many people as possible and then asking them their opinions for their unabashed, blunt or otherwise positions. And the one thing that, that, uh, that struck me is that I didn't really know that I'm, I'm one of the rare subject matter uh, CEOs and presidents of a startup because not only am I actually a real musician of 45 years, not only do I know the, hard, the hardware, the actual equipment itself, and the lingo for 45 years, and have the ability to talk to pro musicians, and having been tested when they're actually asking me about, well, what about this model, do you know, know about it? And I, I could rhyme it off and, and talk to them. So that proof is in the pudding, right? And that really made a difference. I, 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 what you don't know is sometimes know is that you're starting a journey when you're when you do an entrepreneur, whether you're 21 Absolutely. years old or whether you're a little older like myself, is you don't know well, what's going to come at you, and you don't know whether you can rise to the challenges. But I do think like the experience that you come when when you're when you're older, it's it's in, it's absolutely incredible. I think a lot of people who are older they don't think they can be an entrepreneur or have a startup because they think it's a young person's game. But I think it's the complete opposite. I think older people having uh, have making their startup doing their passions can really really make that uh, 90 percent failure rate go down so i, I love the idea of, of the young entrepreneur the young startup person man or woman that i that i meet right and I, the, the the amount of courage it takes to do that and their own belief in their passions is wonderful to see there can be said to be a little bit less experience in these individuals well right? i think it's more that they uh rush into it 
uh, without knowing what it means to own a business. Because what is a startup? You're owning a business, a right. business with responsibilities. And uh, if you really don't have the passion for it, I think there's a big, uh, big thing to say about mental health and entrepreneurship over the past few months. Wow. Even on uh, my personal side, I've seen uh, a lot of friends go through it heavily and uh, have, a lot, have a lot of trouble with it. Uh, there's been suicide deaths and all that kind of stuff within the startup industry because they just don't know what they're getting themselves into. So this big trend of entrepreneurship, I think people should really check in with themselves and really evaluate what they're getting themselves into. So um, I, I have to concur with you. I've seen a lot of stress in a lot of startups. I, I, I specifically haven't explored the mental health um, you know, environment that you just mentioned, but I, you know, I'm concerned about it. Obviously, that I've seen a lot of people go through some some hairy stress. I wouldn't say I'm without stress. I can assure you that my cheery attitude. And all I this, think you've got to like the stress. You've got to like the difference. stress, and you have to rise to the challenge, and you have to to know that that you've got some outs, right? See, the one thing about starting a, a company, you know, that you're owning a business. Like I, I love how skillfully you said that is to say that, well, I think what's important is you've got to have what, what a fork at the end of the road is to go get a job again or to continue with the company because it's been successfully funded or something like that, right? And what that does is that's one of the primary aspects that keeps me alive I mean, from a mental health perspective because it gives me the strength to know that if this fails, here's what's happened. I'm going to my grave to saying, I tried. But I'm not going to go to my financial grave because there's enough people in my network to say that, look, Sanjay, we'll help you find a job if this thing doesn't happen. Absolutely. Right? You know, and that's a good thing. That's always yeah. like the best uh, thing to know, having a network that will help you in your worst time. Right. But let it not be said by me or anyone, frankly, that young startup entrepreneurs should not, should not start. No, well, they I, should. I think they should absolutely start and do it, but they, I think they should be practical. About right. What doing. I will say, uh, just just thirty seconds of soapbox is is uh, I will complain as politely and diplomatic as I can is the help and the mentorship for younger startups yeah. is really truly lacking in, in frankly the fabric Absolutely. of Canada is that there's too many young startup uh, young young entrepreneurs running around with not even an understanding of what an NDA is they go and download NDAs off the internet. And I, I've got to tell you that they're not substantive documents. They could get entrepreneurs in significant troubles. And then when, when for example, and if they score other legal documents off off the internet, uh, when they finally meet with a law firm, they're going to find out their 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 really their documents are not at the standards. Well, right? even even at the end of the day, it is what it is—a paper, and then and a paper will take years in court to prove, depending Certainly. on who the person is. And uh, I think. People should be really careful right. with uh, who they're talking to. Correct. Just be really, really, really realistic. We've kept all of our trade secrets. To add to that, we've kept all of our trade secrets inside. We don't discuss. I've Absolutely. had plenty That's of my not, best friend really lawyers right. selling, keep your mouth quiet. Don't yeah. You don't need to reveal. Well, especially with something like you, which you're trying to push to change the industry. It's going back into the news launch, I do want to get this question in definitely because it's one of my favorite questions. Um, uh, it's a complete diversion, but it's just a question that I need to ask, and it's about the voice technology industry. Right. So we're talking. We're, so over the past ten months, I have seen an explosion in Alexa voice technology and Google Home. It is. It has been incredible. So over the next five years, I think it's only going to blow completely, blow up, and everyone and, and then their mom and dad is going to be just talking to their computer, phone, talking to their house, hey, Alexa, order me this, and it comes the next day. And Alexa has, really, has a really big uh, field in the music right now. It, it, uh, the, uh, the Alexa Echo is it's, it's, uh, sent out as a music device. So how is, is MIDI going to be playing, or is your uh, music launch going to be play, playing a role in that? Are you going to be making an Alexa skill app? or? Is that something that's going to happen? So your, your question, uh, yeah, and by the way, a diverse question indeed as it is and is most welcome. Your question is so topical, it's amazing. So we've got some secret AI aspirations as well. Beautiful. So we've Beautiful. actually uh, really thought carefully and I've been speaking to some people who are in the AI space. I, 
I'm, I'm assisting another startup. I'm, that's another question that I think you'll ask as well. What am I doing? What, what else is it that I'm doing? But I'm assisting a startup on the business and corporate side of things uh, who's assisted me on the AI side. And I've also talked to another AI company. We've learned that we can use AI, but let's answer your question. So AI is an astounding technology. Its learning capability is, is been, has been greatly accelerated as a result of, you know, for example, transformative algorithms like TensorFlow and things like that, right? They're not just, I'll call them the algorithms is actually really denigrating them. They're actually much more sophisticated than that. They're learning to a certain extent, but not the way a, learn, a five-year-old baby can learn, right? That's different. I, uh, I, I vociferously demand that people understand that AI is, is dumber than a five-year-old baby is, that when, if a baby is exposed to a kitten and the kitten meows just once and then the kitten is removed, is that that baby has understood every genre of cat and has figured out the meow thing and every yeah. color and, every, and the shape of cats for the rest of its, of its wonderful life, right? And, and that's amazing. AI doesn't do that today. But the, one of the reasons uh, that voice technology came up so well is it was one of those problems that the scientists and engineers of the world said, this is the first order of magnitude problem. Why don't we solve this problem? There's also lower bandwidth in that problem too. So, and the English word is, English language is 250,000 words. It's not a significantly large data set. Yeah. And neither is the variance of accents is not that significant as well. So it was a problem that I felt that they could tackle, and they did. And suddenly yeah, there's been an explosion. They did brilliantly well from Google Home to accept Alexa and many other platforms, and including what's, in, what's going to happen in your car. You're going to be able to say, issue commands in the car, and the car will recognize you too. Take me here. Yeah, right? exactly. Uh, so I think it's, I, I personally am really, really super excited about it. And I think any uh, business that wants to really uh, market themselves in the, over the next five years and really show the world what they got, I think they should have an Alexa skill app right. at the minimum. So the earliest science fiction series, uh, the, the original series by Star Trek, had the characters in the, in, in, the, in the series actually talking to the computers on board the Star Trek Enterprise. And, and you know, really, there were people have been thinking about this thing for a long time. Now, how does it apply to the music industry? So the problem with the spoken word in the use of our equipment and in the environment that you're in, when you're performing the work efforts to do what you need when you're using our products and or services, is that voice may not be so perfect. It might be slower than your fingers operating a touchscreen interface, for example. Actually, might be slower. And then, and then on stage, there's no way to use your voice to command systems. No. It's not possible. No, it wouldn't be. I just think there might be a completely different way to introduce your... So, here, but here's the deal. But let me not dismiss the idea by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, there is certain areas and times, slight digression if I may. I want you to imagine that you're an oil painter and I give you uh, some, some paint and a paintbrush and then the palette, right? But I only give you two paints, black and white. Well, I mean, you'll play around for a little bit. At some point in time, you're going to get tired. Yep. In the same way of the bass and treble controls or volume, you're just not going to get a lot of variety, right? The color offers you more variety. So what if I gave you, uh, say, a, a color palette with 36 colors on there? Could you explore color more if I gave you 36? Absolutely. Oof. Right. I don't do more. So I want you to imagine that what happens is that we have uh, essentially, the devices and instruments, I gotta keep going to that, essentially they have 110 colors. Mm -hmm. 200, 300, 600. Imagine the variety of sounds you could produce. So what happens is that musicians like to explore their sound landscape. So they're just driven just to want to play and just tweak knobs and all try that. Try completely different things out and see what happens. Exactly. So but what we want to do is make that faster. And then to be able to manage their sounds and to classify and categorize them. Get them from a fellow musician off the internet. And then within two minutes they've got it. They're done. Do you think in the future, when uh, maybe this will happen in a decade down, that someone can say, hey, uh, Google Ray Alexa, um, put these two songs together and let's see what happens. Well, AI has already done that. AI is there's really? actually two yes. known songs in the world where AI engines wrote two songs. Wow. They That's exist. Crazy. Go listen to them. They're, they're, I think one of them is on SoundCloud. So if I find the links, I'll send them to you. But let's not forget about answering your wonderful question about, well, how could Muse Lounge use it? 
within a certain use model, if, 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 if I can use those terms, when you're using a product and services, there's time and a place to say, just use your voice. So here's an example. So rather than walk to the equipment or the computer, you're anywhere in your rehearsal space, you've got your guitar on you, your hands are busy. So you just say, sound number 82. And then you yeah. can just go to it. There, there you you can just do that. Exactly. Or you can say, volume, lower volume by 10 dB or by three increments. You could certainly issue commands to it to have it do that. But noise becomes the problem, right? The signal to noise problem. So what happens is that if you've got five other musicians, let's say one of them's a basis and they just happen to be practicing while you're trying to issue commands, there's going to be a signal to noise ratio problem, right? Yeah. So the, the system may not be able to hear you and that's an issue, right? So if you had a mic and it was your command microphone, let's say it was your singing microphone, it could be too, we could get a tap from that, then it's very possible to issue commands. That's really cool. But what I wouldn't do is to say that those are the definitive answers in this constrained environment. What I would say, given how skillful your question was, is that you never know. Never know. There may be a variety of things that I've not thought of. In other words, the a universe of possibilities with voice control that I've not even thought of. No, I, I think it's a really up and coming thing. So, side hustles. Sanjay, what are you doing on the side? What's, what else are you doing aside from Muse Lounge? So, the one thing I've learned that being in Muse Lounge makes me sick and tired of being in Muse Lounge 10 hours a day. Sometimes it's 12 hours a day. <laughs> Those hours are insane, but, but you know, I can assure you that I think every, every startup entrepreneur does that. They spend ridiculous, and then the weekends, forget about weekends, Saturdays and Sundays are just another day for me to do work. That's the way, that's the life, that's life right now. So what I do is in order to distract myself is I hang out with other people. So I tend to attend many, as many social networking things as I can, like Tech Tuesday is a great one. Yep. Uh, the, 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 the law firm of Gallons, uh, WWG, Gallon, yes. what's the name again? Yep. WLG. Yep. I, they, uh, they invite me to once a month seminars and go to that. Deloitte does the same, go to that, right? The, the, there's an AI startup in town, and because I, he's a musician, and in fact, he, he's assisted me with my company, I thought I'd trade, and so we meet on a monthly basis, and I assist him in the corporate side of things, because so I've got that down. I've got it down to a, to a pretty good science, and this, our, there's always some artistry helping with that. I'm, assi I'm assisting another startup, but that startup's gone quiet for just a little while for a variety of reasons I can't disclose, but they're gonna come back up, and I was assisting them for about a year and a half as well. So, and then playing music is a great thing, is the one thing that, there was a very strange circumstance to me, is that playing music became work. And then a, a couple of friends of mine had a little sit down chat and they said, listen, you know, if you're thinking that playing guitar is work, you need to change your mind about this, this is not a good thing. Again, this, is, this harkens back to that very uh, intellectual concept of managing your mental health when it comes to being a startup is that Sanjay, you know, you only live once and frankly is that you're going to regret not spending time on this period of time when you're playing it, when you're, when you're starting. So get back on the guitar yeah. and we want you to do this. And a friend of mine came over and said, I have a solution. We're going to move this big chunk of equipment upstairs into your office. So when you turn around, I have a music room, which is huge, but we moved one of my systems, because I have three systems in my, in my music system. They're, they're hard to describe, but they're just systems. And one of them is portable, and I moved it upstairs. He helped me lift some very heavy equipment, and he goes, now you're gonna play more often, because you're gonna turn around, and there's your equipment, and you're gonna play. Whenever you need a break, do that. That's good, because that's practitionership, and I think, in a way, you're also, that also helps you out in Muse Lounge, because you're keeping up that passion of your, of your life. Well, well, there's another thing too, is to play when your fingers are rusty is frankly embarrassing in front of another musician. <laughs> Generally, every musician is afraid of playing in front of another musician because these are the people that can determine best how well, yeah, how good you, how are. you are. So non-musicians, I can play anything and they think that this wow, is the greatest thing in sliced bread. <laughs> you're amazing, you're as good as Steve Vai when yeah. you're thinking they're, I'm embarrassed because I did not play well but you thank them for their compliments. But no, in front of another musician. So I've been doing that. I keep thanking my friend to move that equipment upstairs. Again, part of, you know, being mentally, you know, happy, happy. and, you know, and just, 
you know, just wanting to live life and have fun about it too. You have to have fun when you're having this, doing, doing something like this. like this. It's not going to be great. You gotta keep in line, you gotta keep the, everything in tune, you know? You do. It is. Before we uh, wrap up, we do get questions from uh, my Instagram followers. I ask them every week, I'm having a really cool business person in this week, uh, they all have to have a startup, and uh, what would you ask them? And uh, we have two questions that I thought were, were really interesting. Uh, the second was kind of funny, but it is, <laughs> but I did find it interesting, so we'll go for it right now. Um, at Josh RD17 asks, Hi, thank you for giving us the opportunity to ask a question. Okay, I love taking photos and I've been devoted, uh, I've been debating whether or not to start selling them. So my question is, how can I market my photos online or offline to sell in a successful way, website or no website? Great. Um, so thanks to Josh RD17 for, for the question. We want to thank him for that. So, so I happen to be a, a professionally trained photographer. So as well. Wow. And I'm trying to awesome. get back into that as well. I, I just bought a. I, I well, I'm going to look at a uh, an old Canon uh, D7 to do videos right. and go back to some more still photography and shoot videos too, just like you're doing here today. So the question is, okay, so he's got pictures. And he wants to get them out. So I, I've been in the company, some professional photographers right here in Canada. So I, I, I think I've, I, I'm well placed to answer this question. Well, if you don't own a website to show your own pictures, then that's a non-star. That's the first thing you need to do. Is you, Josh should create a website, a good website. If you and, and pick a great theme, make it Word, WordPress because it's very simple to do that. Maybe even use a Wix theme or Big Daddy or GoDaddy, sorry, to, to do that. And then to have a gallery of all of your images, classified, categorized, you know, however you want to hierarchically place or place these pictures, and then get all your friends and family to know it. Have a Facebook page, uh, basically capitalize upon every social media, paid or not, engine that you can get out there is what you should do. Uh, attend every possible uh, photography versage thing that, that's out there in, in Ottawa, because there's plenty. Uh, be in the company of other photographers, amateurs to professionals and everybody in between. And, and frankly, uh, you know, basically offer to take pictures of people, take a variety, uh, you know, take as many diverse pictures as you can, show them to people, show your work. So that would be what I would say for, for Josh. To do. And even going on top of that, I think Josh, you should be uh also focusing on uh, like really building that portfolio up, helping people out in terms of offering free work as well, because in the, it's such a competitive industry right now, photography, and uh, I think uh, getting out there to uh, be really popular, and like you said, you have a lot of photos, so I would even make Facebook ads, where for $4, you can reach a 1,000 people in your area, so I would make those, make choose your top three photos, and just uh, make a Facebook ad of them and uh, start posting them and targeting relevant people of, and your relevant target audience, uh, whether it be other businesses like restaurants that may need photos of their food being taken or if it's a corporate party that needs you to be there. I would, quick, I would just quickly add to that, if, if I may, is that he shouldn't think about um, uh, monetization at the beginning. Yeah, it's absolutely. very simple. You're not born a photographer and yeah. you will not take good pictures. And I can assure you that I've seen lots of lousy pictures from photographers after 35 years of experience. Wow. It's not going to happen, right? Uh, and and I've seen the most incredible ones just from day one of someone just going out and taking photos. It's possible, but you need to be proven, right? In the That's same way that a musician does, it's the same concept. It is a very artistic endeavor. You need to be proven. Don't think about monetization. Get it out there. And then what happens is somebody says, you know what? I think we can use your picture and you get paid for this, yep. then great. But it's very hard to get paid for being a photographer these days. It's, it's much worse than this. Everybody thinks that if they have a smartphone, they're a photographer. Yeah. And I can assure you that is not the case. Do the horrible lenses and lots of other bad things that I won't mention. Yeah, absolutely. But the phone is definitely <laughs> a lot different than people think. Correct. And our second question is by uh, Savvy Vertical. And they ask, what are your thoughts on mascots for brands? Have you ever dressed up in costume to promote a brand? <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the music industry generally, uh, you know, if, if, if I may share the perspective of that, which I know well, but frankly, high tech as well. You know, high tech is occasionally used to mask up, but not really. And I, you know, not, nobody worth their salt ever has, right? And I would say that in the music industry, pe pe people don't need a mascot. 
because they're the mascot. The musician and their music is the mascot. And therefore, I would say no to that. Now, forgive me, if you're a car wash and you dress up in, in a Tigger outfit and you want to get more people running into your car wash, I think it's a great idea. I think it's good, right? Yeah, let me um, out. I think as well is that if you want to think out of what I call conservative kinds of, of means and ways, in other words, like not being a, a very stiff upper lip kind of person that wants to have fun, frankly, you don't, there aren't necessarily rules, but understand that there are consequences that if you use a mask on, the industry doesn't tend to, maybe you should roll with the way the industry does. Your, your chosen industry of choice. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I, uh, from my end, Yes, it does not work that well on uh, on our end. It's uh, I think the dollars can be spent much better just through digital Facebook advertising. On uh, on my end, uh, I think if a company has any money to spend on marketing, if it's uh, if it's under a thousand dollars and they need to get results, they should focus on making really good creative on Facebook. Great. Thank you, Sanjay, for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Danielle, for the opportunity. You're a wonderful interviewer. And a shout out to Danielle, everybody. Uh, if you're chosen by Danielle for an interview, uh, it's, it'll be the best thing that's happened to you. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, thank you guys for watching. I will see you guys this week again on Friday. And take care, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye.